I'm Stuart Reynolds from the Science Group. And uh, tonight I'm absolutely delighted to be able to introduce my old friend Roger Blanford as our lecturer this evening. Roger and I go back a long way, in fact, about 54 years to when we used to play darts and bar billiards while drinking beer in the Pickerel pub at Cambridge. Uh, it feels like only yesterday. In those days, we were students at the threshold of our scientific careers. Well, Roger's done pretty well. Today, he's an eminent theoretical astronomer. Uh, his declared research interests include black hole astrophysics, cosmology, gravitational lensing, cosmic ray physics, and compact stars. And as we'll hear tonight, he's now also thinking about uh, asymmetry and the origin of life in the universe. To use the word that appears in his Wikipedia article about himself, uh, he is in fact famous. Gosh, I wonder who wrote that Wikipedia article. Uh, Roger is indeed famous in the astrophysical community for the Blanford's Nyack process, which is a mechanism for powering relativistic jets by the extraction of rotational energy from a black hole. And that's just the start. In fact, according to Wikipedia, Roger has no fewer than five astrophysical processes and equations named after him. So that as well as the Blanford's Nyack and Blan Blanford pain mechanisms for the formation of relativistic jets, he's also devised theoretical models for jet geometric and spectral, spectral properties, the Blanford Kernigal conical jet model, and uh, not to mention the Blanford McKee solution. How about that? I'm very impressed. He was never that good at darts. And I do note, by the way, that because his name begins with a B rather than a Z, his first name place in all those named equations was assured from the start. Anyway, as I mentioned, uh, Roger studied at Cambridge uh, both as an undergraduate at Magdalen College and then as a research student at what became the very famous Institute for Theoretical Astronomer. Um, he went on to be elected a fellow of St. John's College and then he went to the USA to work first uh, at the Princeton Center for Advanced Study uh, and then at Caltech and uh, most recently uh, he migrated to Stanford University in California where he became the first director of the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. Rogers, a fellow of the Royal Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Physical Society. He's a legacy fellow of the American Astronomical Society and a member of the US National Academy of Sciences. His many international prizes include the Warner Prize for Astronomy, the Shaw Prize, the Danny Heinemann Prize, the Eddington Medal, the Humboldt Prize, the Gold Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society in 2013, the Crawford Prize at the Royal Society. Gosh, uh, they're, they're all there, all of the prizes uh, that is possible to win. Um, Rogers knocked them all down. Um, so, um, absolutely delighted to... Uh, say to Roger, well, Roger, it's all yours now. Um, off you go and tell us about the Looking Glass universe. Well, thank you. For, first, I should ask, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You can. Okay, excellent. Okay, can you see me? Or can you see my slide? Yes, we yes. can. Yes. Excellent. Okay, that's a good start. Well, so then I must say thank you very much indeed, Stuart and everyone else for your kind and completely over the top introduction. Um, uh, I, it's a great thrill for me to be giving this talk and I only wish I were there in your beautiful city and not uh, sitting in my um, r room at home uh, as you presumably are too. So let us hope that we will all be able to meet up in person before too long and I wish you, you have excellent talks coming up that I just heard advertised and I hope that soon you will all be
together because uh, it's much better listening to and gi even giving, giving talks under those circumstances. The topic I'm going to talk about today, today. I've, I've called the looking glass universe and it's going to be a little broad ranging encompassing cosmology, astrophysics, physics, chemistry and biology and consequently quite superficial um, which matches my understanding on many of these topics. Um, I, uh, the work I'm going to describe, um, it's more general than what I've been doing, but it's really been led by my collaborator, Noemi Globus, who may or may not be on this call. And, um, and so she got me into this business and I've been learning a lot from her and it's been fun all along the way. And, uh, and that's, that's as good a reason as any for, doing, for thinking about these topics. Um, I also want to acknowledge Stuart, uh, one of my oldest friends and a, a steadfast friend. And he, taught, he tried to teach me biology uh, when we were students. Um, I was a poor student. Uh, I'm, he, but he's been also trying to teach me some biology because I corresponded with him about the topics here uh, and um, he was immensely helpful and I want to acknowledge that um, and I, um, I hope I, his association with this, uh, these ideas has not dented his otherwise impeccable scientific reputation. So. I'm going to talk about the looking glass universe and I'm going to say a little bit as I say about all of these topics, but where I'm headed is to try and understand why uh, living uh, organisms as we encounter them have one sense of handedness rather than the other. And as I say, this is going to be a journey over many scientific topics and I hope that I can get some of the ideas across to people who are unfamiliar with some of the topics. I suspect everyone in the audience is familiar with some of these topics, but maybe slightly fewer know about all of them. So um, let me begin uh, logically with cosmology and say a little bit just about this. And I'm just going to cherry pick some of the history or story of the universe and modern cosmology is very very different from the subject that I read about and learnt about in the 60s and 70s um, and it now really has provided a very simple description of the universe we see around us today that is causally related to what happened in the past. Now I'm going to try and use a cursor here. I'm not sure. If it, can you see a cursor? Yes, can? yes. You can. Okay. So I'll probably just try and use this. So here's just a cartoon in ridiculous units of the universe from its um, beginning in what is sometimes called the Big Bang through to the present day, which to just give a measure that uh, we have a self-consistent description, it's about 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. And there are various things that happen along the way as happen in regular history. And I'm actually only going to be really concerned about the very earliest times. There is uh, an epoch which has been conjectured about um, nearly 40 years ago now called inflation, which happened at a ridiculously small time in the early universe, maybe 10 to the 34 seconds or so after the Big Bang. So that's really terribly small. And then everything after that sort of followed in a deductive way. Now, as we the universe advances, we understand the physics better and better. And the physics of inflation we don't understand well. And some of the things that happened soon after that, we don't understand terribly well either. But we do understand some general principles and it's those general principles that I'll be sort of latching onto here. Now, this story 
of the universe is not some sort of theological exercise. It's really based on observations and physics. And it's, it's pretty well validated now. And this has been the change from, as I say, 40 or 50 years ago. But it's only successful in so far as it, it, it goes, and many puzzles still remain. Now, I'm just going to focus on, on the one aspect of the universe and not tell you the whole story, but I would like to say one thing because it connects to this, um, this subject uh, which ha where we have a lot of biology, a lot of biologists, I think. We have biologists here. And in some sense, after getting a lot of the physics understood about the universe, much of the current thrust of researching cosmology is telling the story. It's the narrative history of galaxies, which as Stuart just I, Stuart said earlier, that you know, biology is about we revel in complexity, we glory in the complexity. That's absolutely true. And physicists traditionally have, have been reductionists and tried to make everything as simple as possible. And you'll see some of that tension here. So the sort of reductionists have had a field day with describing the universe in terms of physics, but a lot of what people are trying to do now is deal with much more complicated things like galaxies and clusters of galaxies and stars, their births, their marriages, their deaths, their evolution. The word evolution is a very common word in describing this sort of physics. It's the narrative history of the universe. And that is, you have to think in a very different way. And it really is more like biology, the way people have to think about it. They're not going to solve every problem from first principles. They really have to infer what, what sort of happened as a story. And so I hope Darwin um, w would have appreciated uh, seeing this extension of the ideas that he pioneered in the 19th century. Now, the, the part that I want to um, latch on to here is that if we look at the contents of the present universe, there are three major parts. One is dark, called dark energy, it, it, called slightly more accurately and traditionally the cosmological constant, but dark energy was used as a moniker because it, partly because it's a better marketing. Um, and that is about 68% of the universe right now. There's a second part, which is called dark matter, and that's about 27% of the universe. And then there's a third part, which is just regular ordinary matter, the stuff of you and I, and sometimes it's called baryons. And for each of these, I think there, there is a question. The dark energy which dominates the universe now, didn't in the past, but will dominate in its future, and seems to be um, uh, sentencing us to a future of dilution and decay, an agoraphobic's worst nightmare, and don't tell that to Darwin, because I believe he was an agoraphobic. So, um, but this is what we know, but we're not sure about that. And much research at the moment is, is trying to understand the physics of dark energy and to be able to predict what the future of the universe might be. Is it really as simple as I've just described? Or will something else happen? And in this connection, I would draw attention to the theory of inflation, which like dark energy, caused a, a phase of rapid acceleration. And that's what we're experiencing right now with dark energy, but at 10 to the minus 34 or what at seconds, there was a phase of very, very rapid in inflation, of, of acceleration. And, uh, you know, we got out of this mess once in the past. And I'd like to think this is a very British attitude that we can get out of it again if we all try hard enough. But the, the, the simple explanation is this, as I say, we'll just get this ever faster expansion, dilution and decay, the agoraphobic's worst nightmare. But we don't understand it. Dark matter, we can describe it. It's just inert stuff that interacts through gravity and little else. We don't know what it is. There've been major attempts to try and identify it. We do not know what it is. And then for baryons, there's the third problem. For the ordinary matter, the baryons, the third problem is why are they there in any case? And I'll try and explain what, what, what the issue is in the next slide. So when people tell you 
cosmology is like a soul subject or so on, you ask them about dark energy, dark, ask them these questions about dark energy, dark matter and ordinary matter, and you'll find them not so confident that cosmology is, is a soul subject. Okay, so let's go on to this business that I want to focus on, which is the, um, why is there any matter at all? And the issue is really the following, that in this very early universe that we're hypothesizing, which it turns out we have some good um, consequences that have been valid, predictions that have been validated, but it's not something we fully understand. It is very high temperatures at very earlier times. All the particles should be accompanied by anti, what are called antiparticles. These are particles that if they've got charge, they've got opposite charge and so on. And this is what we expect at very early times. And unless something special happens, what, what, what we would expect now is that all of the so-called baryons, these are things like protons, you've heard of protons, so things like protons would be accompanied by antiprotons and so on. There'd be other particles like that. And there would be equal numbers of both. And as the universe expanded and cooled off, you'd have nothing left because they'd all annihilate one with the other. And so there's, the problem with matter is why is there any of it? And a famous Russian physicist, Andrei Sakharov, of course, is even more famous for his political impact, um, explained not in detail how this could have happened, but the general principles that would have had to have happened. And there are traditionally three, three things that would have had to have happened. And one of them, that's the only one I want to focus on, is that physics under these circumstances should look different in a mirror. And this goes by the uh, description parity violation. And um, let me just say a little bit about this. The physics of Newton and Einstein is basically the same in a mirror. If we just had, we made an experiment and they made the mirror image experiment, we get the same answers. And this was for a long while thought would be true of all physics. But in 1957, a famous experimental physicist made a beautiful experiment, Jen Xiong Wu, and she looked at what radioactive decay, in fact, of cobalt, and that's shown schematically here. And what she found was that the physics looked different in a mirror in this experiment. This is called parity violation. And it's a characteristic of one of the four fundamental interactions of physics called the weak interaction. It's, and the Sakharov's conjecture point was that this had to be important at early times. Other things had to be important, but this was one of them. And, and the big takeaway from this is it's a tiny effect that's expected at very early times. And, but it has a large consequence in that um, uh, my old friend Bob Fosbury is made of this bar the same baryons that I am um, and not made of anti-baryons. If he had, I would never have shaken his hand. So, um, so this is one of the consequences of this. And the reason, the fundamental reason for this, sorry, go back. Um, the, there we go. The fundamental reason for this is that in these radioactive decays, and this is the particular one that um, was investigated, uh, you make a particle called here a neutrino. In this case, it's an anti-neutrino. And the neutrinos, sorry, something seems to be unstable here. Sorry, the neutrino, anti-neutrinos and the neutrinos have a specific hand in this. They ha it's, the, it's like if they were with the Earth, it could only spin one way and not spin the other way. It's not the same as that, but it's rather similar. And we call this characteristic spin. And another way of putting, in other words that are used, and I will use, are chirality and helicity. Those are slightly different, but we don't need the legalistic distinctions here. Neutrinos were postulated in, the 19, in 1930 by Wolfgang Pauli, shown here. And uh, it wasn't until the 1950s that is a big surprise. It was shown that they had this characteristic handedness. And as far as physics is concerned, 
they imposed this chirality, this preference for one handedness over the other through physics that involves the weak interaction. Now I want to skip into the sort of history, I suppose, basically of chemistry. And this is going back to the 18th century that Carl Scheele, um, he examined tartaric acid used in um, wines. Um, probably. Put that down. Better. Um, so Carl Scheele uh, looked at uh, tartaric acid in wines and um, then Jean-Baptiste Biot, who was a physicist, looked at the uh, at this tartaric acid and he discovered something really very surprising. That when you had polarized light, like you would see from a Polaroid, if it went through a sample of this tartaric acid, the plane of polarization, the direction in which the electric vector vanishes, and you can just do this with a simple experiment with sunglasses if you like, uh, would be rotated. This is called our optical activity. In this case, it's, it's dextro-rotatory, it's not shown here. Other substances are levo-rotatory, it means left and right. But there's a clear direction in which you, sense in which you rotate the plane of polarized light. And this was a big and amazing discovery at the time. Now, if we, there we are. If we move um, forward to, uh, Pasteur, he um, explored this further and he found that regular tartaric acid that was made um, uh, not in a biological process but in, in a sort of chemistry process did not do this optical activity. But then what he did was he crystallized his tartaric acid, separated it into two different types of crystal, which you can see here, which are mirror images of each other. And if he separated them into these two mirror images, one rotated the plane to the left, the other rotated to the plane to the right. And, the tar and one of them corresponded to the biological tartaric acid that came from the wine casts. The other was, wasn't present in, in biological processes. And so it, it, this was the first evidence, if you like, from Pasteur, who we kind of need working on the problem right now for his, his, his skill in understanding about vaccination. Um, this uh, discovery said it was the first sort of indication that living things had a preferred handedness, just like those neutrinos. I want to say something about left and right here. It's terribly confusing. If you go through science, then people's conventions for left and right are variable. And so one person says left for, for light and another person says right for light and they're talking about the same thing. And so the key thing is that there's one set of uh, rotation, one, one type of rotation, there's the opposite type of rotation and that's associated with something underlying uh, the biological uh, organisms. So if we go on to what Pasteur then did, and he wrote, uh, he was very, he was of course a very uh, far-sighted scientist in many ways, and this is no exception. And he talked about an asymmetric force that would have to be responsible at some sort of microscopic level that would be responsible for this choice of one handedness associated with the crystals that, that, were, that were produced by a lot biological processes. And of course, if we look at this in a modern way, then we would say as chemists that a, a simple amino acid like alanine, which as we've sketched it here, there are two forms which are distinguishable in a mirror great parity, if you like. And so I won't go through the details of this, but you can see these are different in a mirror. And chemists regularly will make both forms in what is called a racemic mixture. 
But when we're dealing with biological processes, typically we see in this case, the levo uh, alanine, and I don't want to, um, uh, as I say, but don't, don't worry about left and right because it, it's only a convention. What's important is that one choice is made. So um, now let's go on to something everybody knows about, and that is DNA at some level. And again, when we uh, look at the DNA that's present in um, in human in, in human beings and other organisms, we find that there's this wonderful double helix, and it twists to the right in this sense. So we can think about it as twisting to the right, and we could just as easily imagine the left-handed version. There's a bit of a joke I call the the one that we encounter in biology as the live system and just reversing the letter, not the order of the letters. In the left-handed one, um, it's the evil system, and the live system is the one that we encounter in biology. And so there's these two systems, and so like Tweedledum and Tweedledee from Tenniel's drawing here, uh, we could just as easily imagine Tenniel having drawn in this way with their names, uh, on the on their right colors rather than on the left colors as they've got here and so on. So they're distinguishable. These are uh, mirror images of each other, obviously. And this is the one that's in the book. And this is the one that isn't. And uh, let's go on to the next slide. So so, so I'll just say that so life has for some reason made this choice in terms of what we will call chirality. This is this handedness, uh, just like the neutrinos. And the, the question is why? Why is it, did this come about? Is it just by chance or is there a causal reason? Now I'm now going to segue again into a different topic. I'm now going to go into astronomy. Here, is a supernova explosion in our galaxy. It happened about 350 years ago in, our, in terms of when the light arrived to us. It's, in, uh, it's now known originally by the radio astronomers but now by everybody else as Cassiopeia A, which means it's in the constellation Cassiopeia. There was an explosion of a massive star that left behind a neutron star, which is about the mass of the sun and only 10 kilometers across. So it's essentially matter at nuclear density at the center. And you can, it's now being discovered and you can see it there. It's an explosion. So it took the nuclear processed elements that were made in the, um, in the during the explosion and then expelled them throughout the galaxy. And this is the way that the majority of the heavy elements, the ones that are heavier than helium in the periodic table, the way that they are made and, uh, and also equally importantly, dispersed. And so as uh, Joni Mitchell said in an oft quoted uh, line from a song, we are stardust, we are golden. But these um, uh, supernova explosions, just returning to another theme, are also terribly important because they control the evolution of our galaxy by sending, they're sending not just heavy elements in, out into the galaxy, into the interstellar medium, they are also sending energy into the interstellar medium and they have a major impact on the evolution. Here's this biological word again, the evolution of our galaxy, not of the universe at large, of our galaxy. So these supernova explosions do evolution. So again, you can see some astronomers and astrophysicists thinking in ways that parallel those of biology. There's a third thing that these supernova explosions do, and they happened about once a century in our galaxy, 
the third thing these supernova explosions do, it's an explosion, so it makes a giant shock wave that expands into the surrounding interstellar gas. And that giant shock wave makes cosmic rays. These are high energy particles. And this makes most of the cosmic rays that we see uh, in our solar system at Earth. So supernova remnants like this, um, sorry, shock waves like the ones here in Cassiopeia A, shown you can actually see it there in blue, those shock waves we believe accelerate the cosmic rays that we see at Earth. And those cosmic rays are going to be the next part of my story. These cosmic rays after they are made do not come directly to the Earth, they meander rather slowly through the galaxy traveling at speeds, or average speeds, they, 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 their physical speeds are always as, it's almost as fast as the speed of light, but they keep on scattering off the magnetic fields in the galaxy, and so it takes them a long time to get from, say, Cassiopeia to us. But nonetheless, they are present uh, at Earth from all of the supernova explosions that have happened over the past 10 million years, they contribute to the cosmic rays we see at Earth. So going again in this random walk through science, let's think about the cosmic rays which come and hit Earth. We'll have a very high energy particle, and although they don't come from supernova remnants, the highest energy particles in cosmic rays can have energies as energetic as a well hit cricket ball. Think about that for a moment. These actually have other sources than the supernova remnants, but we see cosmic rays with energies that, that high, a well hit cricket ball. More modest cosmic rays, but still very impressively energetic ones, are primarily protons. And because of this predilection of the early universe in the story I've told you for making baryons with positive charges, rather than the antibaryons with negative charges, those cosmic rays have positive charges. Now, when those cosmic rays hit our atmosphere, for which we should be very grateful, when they hit our atmosphere, they then create a whole lot of other particles. This is sometimes called, a, can be called a shower, and they'll make lots of other particles. And by the time all of this gets down to Earth, we're looking, in the case of our atmosphere, at muons and electrons. So if we look over here, we have a cosmic ray. It'll hit nitrogen uh, atoms in the atmosphere, and it'll make other elementary particles. In this case, these are pions. And because it's positively charged to start off with, it makes more positively charged pions than negative ones. And these pions uh, decay into other elementary particles, which are called muons, and they're shown here. These are muons. These are about 200 times the mass of an electron. And then these muons decay, although it takes, sometimes takes, they go a long distance before it happens, they decay into electrons. And so what we have in the cosmic rays on Earth is typically these muons and some of these electrons. And so the thought is that the cosmic rays, which carry this uh, weak interaction, neutrino-inspired uh, chirality, also reflect that in their properties. So if we look, for example, at a muon here, it'll move with a certain velocity as it's coming towards the Earth, which will be close to the speed of light. It will have this quantity called spin. And unlike the neutrinos, it has a charge. So that means that it has a little magnet associated with it. And magnets in my elementary particles have north and south poles, just like they do on your fridge. And what you find is that the particles that you have here, uh, in fact, the ones that both charge, have the same direction of their magnetic moment it's called it's the direction of the north and south part of the magnetic of the magnet relative to their velocity as they hit the earth as they come down and hit the earth 
And this is a quantity I'm going to call uh, lodacity. It's similar to the helicity, but helicity deals with spin and chirality in physics. This is related to the magnetic moment, and I'm going to call this lodacity. And they have a well, a quite large lodacity. So we have these particles with magnets associated with them pointing backwards from the way in which they're going. Then we're going to start imagining having some biological organism, shown schematically here as DNA, and it's going to be irradiated by these cosmic rays in some environment. I'm going to call it a fount. This is quite general. It's some environment where life is happening. It may be life for the very first time. If it's the fount, it's really life for the very first time. It may not be on Earth. It may be in some other environment and uh, life came to here from outside. I, would, I wouldn't have taken this hypothesis very seriously 20 years ago, but for reasons I won't explain now, I think one should take it seriously. It's certainly not a given, but it, it, one should take it much more seriously than one might have done. And so this fount is an environment where life might have originated. And I'm going to specialize to one of the possibilities for the origin of life, of course, a huge subject in which many people have produced many interesting and important ideas. And this is the idea that the handedness that is carried now by the cosmic rays is going to be transferred to life as transbiotic molecules, not as, not as uh, prebiotic molecules, very simple things like the amino acid alanine, and not sophisticated biological molecules like DNA, but molecules that are struggling uh, to, um, to start to be living, to start to replicate and do all the things that characterize very crude living systems. And I'll emphasize a point here, which may come up later, is it's probably when you go down below ground, you know, this could have happened in a different place, or it could have happened on the surface of the Earth. But if you start going below ground, certainly, then you're really the cosmic rays that dominated the muons. And these are ones that are carrying the lodacity, this word that I use. Now, I'd like to say something that's a tremendous oversimplification of a lot that people have done, is that cosmic rays, I think, are probably good for you. Um, it's viewed as a species but only in very, very small quantities because they're one of the, not the only way, but one of the prime ways of inducing mutations and bringing and promoting natural selections and so on. How they do this is, I, I think it's fair to say, pretty poorly understood. We have a lot of empirical evidence, of course, but the actual mechanisms, the chemical mechanisms and so on, we don't understand terribly well. And it may involve the ionization of electrons, in which the cosmic rays obviously have a natural role for doing that. It may not. Um, another thing I would emphasize, though, is my in moderation there. It's clear that heavy doses are, are bad for you. I mean, Chernobyl is the uh, terrible um, example of this. Uh, Mars is a... Uh, is a place where people want to send astronauts. They're going to be exposed to cosmic rays, not protected by an atmosphere like on Earth. That is going to be a very dangerous place. And one wonders how many people have really thought this through. Historically, there have been massive solar flares. They could be, certainly in the early Earth, could be responsible for a lot of uh, major changing cosmic radiation. So um, now, Let's take the story forward again to what is basically physics. And I'm going to do what physicists are prone to do, which is to um, oversimplify something very complicated and make a, uh, it's a common phrase in physics is take a spherical cow. So if you want to do, if a physicist tries to be a farmer, they will theorize about what, a how a spherical cow would behave, which of course is a start, but not a very good start. So what I'm going to do here is take all these complicated biochemical complexity and just make two very simple models of a, a, bio, in this, of a biological molecule. 
One is to take a very simple unit called a tripod, where the legs of the tripod are of unequal length. And that is clearly chiral. It looks the opposite in the mirror, as I've tried to show it here. A second and um, slightly more complicated case, but a more realistic and probably more relevant case, is to model a biological molecule like DNA, for example, as a barber pole with a twist. And we've got these two uh, helicities in the, in the helix here. And um, then what I'm going to say, I'm going to take this lodaceous cosmic ray, this one with lodacity that's carrying this handedness. I'm going to do some sums and I'll spare you the math and ask, how this might differentially affect the ionization of these two forms of tripod, say, or these two forms of barber pole. And the answer is there is a difference. And one of these two forms will be preferred at a very small level. And so if we take the lodaceous cosmic rays and these chiral molecules, we imagine we've got equal numbers of the chiral molecules then the amount of ionization or some equivalent process, or equivalently the amount of a butation that might follow from that is going to have a chiral bias. And the chiral bias, are, there are various ways of estimating this. It's particularly small in this case, it's bigger in this case, but still very, very small. Now, the next part of my story is Let's think about this fount with these equal numbers of uh, left-handed and right-handed, whatever that means, life forms, all changing, reacting, interacting, crashing into one another, exploring ways to try and find pathways. They're not sort of doing this in some mental way in some deliberative way it's just they're exploring all the possibilities around there and some of them we think will have led to some very crude inefficient clunky way to replicate now if there's a very tiny bias in making those mutations and and this is important you have many generations and you may have millions, you may have billions, and under some circumstances, you may even have trillions of generations at work there. A tiny bias may lead to homochirality. And this bias is permanent. It's imprinted in the cosmic rays and derives from the earliest stages in the universe. And the process we're talking about is somewhat similar, but not obviously not the same, but has some similarities to what happened with the baryons in the early universe. And if you have, in addition, if you say, well, the, we haven't got quite enough uh, uh, generations to promote this homochirality, then it turns out we did some little sort of exercises in population biology and so on, that if you introduce an actual conflict, an equal conflict between live and e evil molecules, that can actually promote the production of one dominant form of chirality at the end of this e long evolution, which will ultimately then lead on to more sophisticated organisms and uh, ultimately Homo sapiens and much else besides. So I'd like at this point to show a very busy slide and I'm not going to go through any of this. All I want to say is that many people have thought about these problems in many different ways. And there are some, obviously some similarities between ideas that are already well developed in the literature and in many cases also developed in terms of thinking about experiments. And uh, we have a particular angle, I suppose, which I think is original, we think is original but it could well be that we're uh, di working with the quite wrong or unnecessary ideas, and some of these other ideas are important. Let me just say a little bit about this. The first person to think about the weak interactions in this context was the famous physicist Abdus Salam, uh, but the effect was even smaller than the ones we're talking about. And I think we've sort of advanced from what he discussed 
by having much larger but still small effects. Another possibility that's been very um, popular is that circularly polarized radiation in astronomy can be responsible. A third possibility is that natural radioactivity under the surface of the Earth rather than the cosmic rays themselves could be responsible. And these are really, these have been mostly applied in the context, as I say, of prebiotic molecules like alanine and so on, and uh, imposing the chirality there rather than what we are doing which is saying this happens in more complicated molecules that are long chain polymers that are where you have a choice between left and right. And the effects that we are talking about, as I said, were small, but there are some indications that there are other effects used that we are eager to go on to understand better. And there's a famous chiral induced spin selectivity, which is an amazing physics effect that was found with uh, spin polarized electrons with much lower energies than the cosmic rays we're talking about. And that produces this differentiation in a quite extraordinary way. Okay, so let me go on. Where is this go? Where are we headed? Where is this going? Well, I think this is one of the reasons why I'm very excited about this business, even if we've got the, the wrong set of ideas is that there's a, a lot that's going on right now. And I think it will open up a lot of discovery space. One of the things is of course, sample return. And there's the Rosetta um, space mission, which I think was launched in 2004. And sadly, the lander landed in a dark canyon. It was a, a bit of a fluke, it was very unlucky and didn't, wasn't able to perform the experiments that it was required to do. And in fact, I think my collaborator, Naomi Globus, has actually been thinking about these ideas since the launch of Rosetta in 2004. So this is not, not a, an instant thing. Um, here's a more successful one. This is the Japanese Hay whoops, Hayabusa mission. Here's the sample return. Of course, we, it's just, just happened. We don't know. There's OSIRIS-REx that's coming in a couple of years, uh, an American venture. Uh, oh, wait, it's an international venture, actually. And so, you know, who knows what will, what people will find? Will they find, like they sometimes find with meteorites, um, a preference for one chirality over the other or not? Uh, will they find living forms or evidence to fossilize living forms? Again, an exciting possibility. Will people on Mars see the same, same idea? We know that Mars was very different in the past with there's evidence now, quite recent, for subsurface water. This allows what the famous wet dry cycles, which many people have thought about in the context of the origin and development of life on Earth. There are asteroids and, and there's Venus, there's Titan and so on. They have, asteroids don't have atmospheres. Venus has a very much thicker one than we have. Conditions are very different there than they are um, on Earth. And so the cosmic rate, it may be that the uh, development of life happened in some other environment and then was exported to Earth. All of these things are possible. Looking in the interstellar medium, and in fact, the poster for this talk had a mention of propylene oxide, which uh, interstellar uh, millimeter astronomers have uh, just found. And this is the first chiral molecule. It's been not been shown to exhibit chirality yet, but they've found a molecule which could exhibit chirality. That's a big step forward. People looking in the atmospheres of exoplanets and so on, they can see chirality too. If we look on Earth, there's the extremophiles, which, which are being found increasingly in, um, in very strange environments, very different evolutions, quite distinct and presumably not homogeneous with the other forms of life. And, and then if we go back three and a half billion years, uh, we see evidence of the earliest forms of life. That's uh, the Earth itself is only four and a half billion years old. And this is one billion years after the start. There's already evidence for life having formed. So all of these are possibilities for seeing if handedness is universal in biological systems. And if it turns out you find environments where you just get living things that are the opposite of, um, of, of what we experience locally, then the ideas we're proposing uh, are dead in the water. And another approach which we're quite excited about, and uh, friend and colleague David Diemer at 
uh, UCSC has already started thinking about doing some of these experiments and they're really quite practical and they're not so hard. And it's surprising that so many of them have not been done as yet where you might sort of irradiate biological samples with uh, polarized, uh, spin, so-called spin polarized electrons exhibiting this chirality and just see what happens. I think you, doing these in the, in the spirit of just pure investigation and finding out what would happen it is of interest independent of this um, connection that we have tried to make to homo chirality. So there's a lot that can be done, I think, quite, quite rapidly and quite practically. So let me just summarize this talk. I'm slightly over my time, for which I apologize, but only a few minutes. What I've tried to do in this talk is just take you through a tour of cosmology, astrophysics, physics, um, chemistry and biology, a, a particular path to lead to a possible explanation for why DNA twists to the right and so on. And this story is basically the parity violation in the early universe left us with these positive charged particles. They were, some of these were accelerated as cosmic rays in supernova explosions. They then hit our atmosphere and made polarized muons or chiral muons and electrons. And they did this at a time that the first transbiotic molecules were forming either here or elsewhere. And these cosmic rays, they cause uh, the mutations with a tiny chiral bias for live over evil. And then evolution initially led to a sort of universal chirality and the universal choice, which um, then was allowed to develop. And this certainly made it easier to, for evolution to proceed to what we see around us in the zoo today. And I think there's, uh, the thought I would like to leave is the one on the last slide, last two slides I should say, is that we hope to learn a lot more over the next decade. I think the, you know, the prospects of just being surprised by discovery over the next decade are great. We're not waiting 20 years for the definitive experiment. A lot of small stuff, things can happen and they're sort of already in the works. So thank you very much for listening uh, to me and I'd be very happy to try to an answer questions. Right, it's over to Bob Fosbury to uh, uh, guide the, the questions. Um, if you want to raise a question, please put it into the chat channel. Okay, well, thank you very, very much, Roger. I, I was fascinated to hear this angle on what I would call another one of the very, very few potential biomarkers for observational astronomers to look for. I know that people are looking very hard at circular polarization in various uh, kinds of things. Um, I, actually, at the moment, I can only think of one other direct really direct biomarker rather than the, in, the inferred biomarker. And that's the uh, possible identification of chlorophyll on other, on other planets, which mm. within the bounds of possibility, it says a it would, discovering that would say a lot about uh, convergent evolution, I think, which would be very interesting. But I think your, your circular polarization uh, idea is absolutely fascinating. So I, I have a set of questions here. Um, some of them, I think, are questions that could be answered with almost one word, but uh, uh, maybe I'll ask them anyway. Um, there was just a question about your uh, three forms of matter, dark energy, uh, dark matter, and ordinary matter. And the question is, these percentages are by mass. OK, yes? Uh, yes, by mass densities, yes. OK. Um, uh, second question was, where does the ordinary energy fit? So, uh, Bob, can you interpret what is meant by ordinary energy? Well, I think, I, we, uh, in fact, Jeff Wilson has answered the question for you. E equals mc squared. I think ordinary matter and energy go together. Um, that next Sorry. question. The next question was answered actually by somebody else. Um, uh, here's a question from Roger Moses, who uh, knows a lot more than many people about cosmic rays, uh, who asked, 
The muons are unstable, and the ones we see are the product of nuclear processes, both strong and weak, in collisions with matter in our locality, mainly our atmosphere, not something left over from the Big Bang. Yes, absolutely. The muons are made locally. The connection to the Big Bang is the protons. And it's the, pro the fact that we live in a universe, it appears, in which the protons all have positive charge and are not antiprotons, for example. That is the, uh, the residue from the Big Bang. Right. And so then one of those protons hits our atmosphere and it will make pions, which will be mostly positively charged because the protons and other nuclei that are doing this are um, sorry, the protons and other nuclei that are doing this um, uh, are going to make pod the preferentially positively charged nuclei, positively charged pions, excuse me, and those pions will then decay into positively charged muons, which they themselves, if you, if you have a nucle nucleon and you hold it, in, uh, a muon, sorry, and you hold it in your hand, it decays in two microseconds. But because of special relativity, when it crosses the universe, when it, when it moves at high speed, it lives for a lot longer and travels a lot further. Instead of a few hundred meters, it will travel a much greater distance. So that way, a muon made in of sufficient energy made in the upper atmosphere can go below the surface of the Earth. And in fact, if we look in the deep mine, it's the muons that are the major source of radioactivity. That, but they're made locally in the atmosphere. Okay, thank you. Um, just a short one. Can the concept of chirality be, uh, chirality be explained a bit more? <laughs> um, I, I think the logical answer to that is yes. Um, and uh, um, let, let me just say it's really, for the purposes of this talk, we should just think of it as two handednesses. I, I gave example, you know, on the one hand and on the other. Can you see me on the one hand and on the other hand? My hands are more or less similar, except one's got a wedding band on it. Uh, but otherwise, they're more or less similar. But they're mirror, except more or less mirror images of each other. I'm right handed in terms of what I do. And so my right hand's a little larger than my left hand. But roughly speaking, they're mirror images of each other. And the chirality is really saying we have two choices of physical of systems, be it in physics be it in um, uh, biology. And what seems to happen in physics is if we're only interested in the sort of physics of regular, new, uh, of what we call strong interactions and the physics of Newton and Einstein and so on, then there's no preference between these two. But when we go into the weak interaction, we have this particle called a neutrino and a neutrino only has a left hand associated with it, associated with its so-called spin, and the antineutrino has a right hand associated with it. And the sort of things that they're associated, the sort of processes that they're associated with look different in a mirror. And so that fundamental physics chirality is there and it's part and parcel of what physicists deal with. The biological chirality is also there, and it's part and parcel of what people making vaccines deal with. And this came up, of course, in the in, in the famous and tragic story of thalidomide. And uh, the, our, our notion is that these two types of chirality are connected, and the connector is basically cosmic rays. Right. Okay, uh, Aidan uh, says, within DNA, the preferred chirality is the D form, yet within amino acids, the L form is preferred in polymers. Why does the influence of cosmic rays with the same chirality produce different handedness across these molecules? Okay, let, let me emphasize something. Let me repeat something I emphasized before. Beware of these words left and right um, when it comes to describing which form you have. It's either for polarization or it's for some uh, 
a molecular structure that will look opposite in a mirror. Uh, it's largely historical, and as I say, just, just one little anecdote here. When I was a student, one of, another student, I think, worked for a year on a um, uh, starting on a thesis, trying to look at look at some effect, and it was the the thesis was predicated on a misunderstanding that people in Manchester use the opposite convention for circular polarization <laughs> than people in Cambridge, and so left-handed in Manchester was right-handed in Cambridge. So DNL, that of course labeling something terribly important, but the choice of DNL is just a convention. So I, I would say that, and. Um, uh, originally it related to the way in which they rotated the plane of polarized light, but that is in turns out to be wavelength dependent. So, you know, if you looked at a different wavelength, you would see a different rotation. So, you know, the, 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 the fact there's a chiral choice in biology and in physics is real and terribly important. The names that are used to label this are not so. Uh, the next question is from Peter Harper, and uh, I guess it's contained in your paper, but uh, uh, his question is, the big question is how chirality is read off chiral molecules to generate chiral organisms. Um, I, I'm not quite sure I understand read off. Um, and I'm... Can we can we um, unmute Peter Harper perhaps? To... Okay. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, Peter. Thank yes. you. Yes. Your yes. Well, just the question is: uh, organisms are clearly chiral. I mean, you know, nearly all all of us have hearts on the left and all that sort of thing. Um, the developing organism. I mean, it's obviously, you know, it can use gravity and it can use front and back and, you know, for two dimensions. The third dimension, it's completely all at sea. It just doesn't, somehow it's got to find a way to reliably be left or right. And, and I'm assuming that has to come somehow from the chiral molecules. But can, can you imagine any other way in which, is, yeah. is it a quantum effect? Or is it, it can't be cosmic rays, surely. Well, um, uh, th th that's it. I think you you raised actually. I won't thank you for one question. I'll thank you for these three. <laughs> We're very good. Um, first, when it comes to, you know, I said I'm right-handed, and you know most people are, but you know a, a, a sizable minority are left-handed. But we all have the same type of DNA. It isn't as though you know people who are who are pick up a coffee cup with their left hand. Um, are um, uh, have the opposite DNA. They they have the same DNA. So you should be a little bit aware of that, and you you know think about Flanders and Swan when the left-handed uh, <laughs> yes. couple meet yes. right-hand. I there are people here who um, who remember that, and yes. uh, you know, and of course that's to do with the rotation of the sun and um, and so on. Um, and uh, with the motion of the sun, I should say, so be, be precise. Um, so, uh, so it re I'm really thinking about the sort of bio at the biological level, and the way I, I would look at it. And you know, I think biologists would may look at this rather, biochemists may look at this really rather differently. But um, the biologists are, you know, biochemists are going to say we basically got two structures here and we've got two choices we can two systems we could we can say look this all works on earth locally for uh, the creatures in the zoo for my family uh for microorganisms and so on they all work together and they they all have a, a um an ecological interaction and so on and i can as a thought experiment, create a mirror image set of exactly the same things. And I believe that it would function in a, essentially just the same way as far as anything you could ever do or measure or think about it. They'd be just the same. And there'd be two separate systems. Now, within one system, I actually know that this happens, that there are certain, say, amino acids. And you, in that system, you can have both chiralities present. 
in one particular function, you need the what you the previous people would call the lever rotatory form. Uh, in the other uh, in the other function, you would have the dextro rotatory form. And then in the mirror world that we've just made in a thought experiment, lever would become dextro and dextro would become lever with those with those names. And it's just having the two systems that I think is the key thing, rather than fixating on these words left and right. Okay, thank you. Um, how can, uh, this is Dave James, uh, how can chirality be observed for the interstellar medium? I think that's a lo another lovely question. Thank you so much. As we, we mentioned, I think it, appear it appeared on this um on the slide um uh, uh on the poster sorry um propylene oxide has recently been found by by some colleagues of mine in germany i think they were the ones who were mostly doing this uh, using the alma telescope in chile and that is a chiral molecule if you look at its structure it is chiral now what they've seen they've only seen evidence of a, a racemic mixture equal amounts of left and right if you like and that's all they have. But you could imagine circular polarized uh, millimeter waves from some environment, which would say we have got one form rather than the other. I believe, if, I believe it is possible to do that. And that would require, I think, a magnetic field and you have to understand the direction of it and so on. But I think all of these things are in principle possible. I don't have a good understanding at all of how far away such an observation would, would have to be. Um, so, but in principle, I think that it, that is possible that we can do it spectroscopically, but it, it could be a very long way in the future. That I just don't know. Could I just in, inject a, a comment and a question? Yes, please, please. I'm not sure I can answer it myself, but uh, the question is how sensitive we can be uh, in detecting circular polarization in practical observations of environments where we might be able to determine uh, chirality. And uh, I don't know if Bill Sparks is on the, on, on, oh. on, the, on the Zoom somewhere, whether somebody in the audience can answer that question. But um, I defer to Bill uh, uh, on this, certainly. Uh, so if he has, that would be great because I don't have a. I mean, you can measure circular polarization quite accurately now with millimeter telescopes. That can be done, but whether or not it's up to this task, I just have no good sense. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question. I think it, it can be detected very sensitively, even in the optical. I think, but uh, mm. I'm not sure about the the limits for this kind of experiment. And the other thing, you know, I, I again, I would ask this is a rhetorical question, but what kind of environments would one best look at in order to uh, detect a, a useful signal? Um, I think experiments have been done on, on microbial mats and so on, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, I, 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 think, I think one, you know, sample return and so on is, um, is interesting and it doesn't necessarily mean a lander on a planet. I think um, Freeman Dyson, one of his many very imaginative ideas was that you could, um, you know, imagine lots of meteoritic impacts on say, say Europa or something like that, um, you know, expelling little flakes of, of ice and out into, into interplanetary space where they might contain little, little amounts of organisms and so on. Um, and so you just take a spacecraft dragging some flypaper around the um around the around the around the inter interplanetary medium picking up little little bits of ice that might have come from chip chipped off things and if they you know he, he i think he called it freeze dried fish you'll be looking for um but it, you know you might you could in principle find things that way um that uh you know, if there if there is life on these other planets, and I, uh, you know, I emphasize I'm totally agnostic about this, and and that means that scientifically I'm all in favor of trying to find out. Okay, another question from uh, David Sang here: um, If the difference effect of laudaceous muon mutations is so small, 
wouldn't you expect this effect to be swamped out by other interactions or variable muon fluxes, depending on the local environmental conditions? I guess we should not assume that all such chiral bias processes promote the same chirality uh, to regions where one dominates over another. Uh, again, uh, pe perhaps it might be surprise, uh, but I, I, I actually agree with that. It's not at all a given that uh, even given a very large number of generations, that a small chiral bias can still prevail because there could be other effects going on. And the other possibility, which I would say probably most, most people do, um, do believe, I think, is that this, you know, the choice that has been made is purely one of chance. It's just a pure fluke. And, you know, and if that's the case, then if we go to some completely separate environment, it ought to be different. It ought to be the opposite. You would have a chance of it. You know, if you just go to one and it's the same, well, that, that's right. But if you go to ten and they're all the same, then it isn't probably isn't a matter of chance. And you know, I, I'm personally, I'm, I'm probably a little more maybe out of naivete, but I'm more influenced by the fact that essentially everything one has looked at on Earth seems to belong to the same system mm -hmm. so far. And it, as I say, but tomorrow somebody may find to dig, dig around in a volcano. Um, find some extremophile and, and then do some analysis of that and say, you know, all the amino acids are the op opposite chirality. Well, I hope we'll start finding these things soon. I mean, I, we do have new telescopes coming up, which will make it uh, more feasible to look at some of these delicate uh, issues. But I have another question here from Donovan Webb. Uh, he thanks you for... Uh, in your Inherit the Earth slide, how many generations were needed to reach uh, uh, in anno to purity? Also, do you know how your cosmic ray theory uh, compares in efficiency to the, to the origin of chirality by the theory of adsorption to chiral media like clays in a prebiotic era? Yeah. Um... Okay, two, 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 two things there. I think the well, let's say the second one first. The um, the clays and so on, which which again have magical, <laughs> proper, physical and chemical properties. We've read some of that literature. I don't think we un understand too well the interactions, but I, I would say it's somewhat disjoint from the cosmic ray story, but a very interesting possibility, and one that I would. I, I would take very seriously. So the things that people, you know, people, and, and the other thing, of course, that's nice about it is it could, again, you can do experiments. You know, you, you know, and I think so, so much of what's been happened in this business is people have gone off and done, you know, pointless experiments because it's obvious what the answer is. And it turned out it wasn't obvious what the answer was, is they've made a real discovery. And so I'm a great personally, I'm a great enthusiast for people, you know, is that you know they're they're, a lot of these are very quick and easy things to do. It's for people just going off and not having too many hypotheses at the back of their heads and just going off and see what happens. You know, sometimes that's not a good good strategy, but in this case, I think it almost certainly, almost certainly is. Okay, Mark Manford, uh, is there not a biological evolutionary pressure for chirality because complex organic molecules, complex molecules require a complex quaternary structure that only function in left or right dextro, uh, lever, levi or dextro forms. So enzymes drive a need for uniform chirality, question mark. Oh, okay. Um, for, firstly, can I ask, what, how do you spell the surname of the questioner? Uh, M-A-N-F-O-R-D. Oh, I, saw, I misheard you. I thought it was the same as mine, so I was just no. going to... Um, uh, make some fraternal greeting, but okay, all right. So the, the, the question is um, the enzymes and so on. Yes, the, again, I, I'm not a, n neither a biologist nor a biochemist, and my, and um, and some of the things I may say in in the immortal phrase of Wolfgang Pauli, whose picture you saw, I think, on the on the third slide, um, uh, I'm not even wrong. But uh, let me, I mean, nonetheless, uh, bla blaze, 
please ahead. Um, it, it seems to me, firstly, that if you were a sort of engineer stuck with the periodic table and trying to make a living sort of thing biochemically, you'd be, you, you'd be stuck with carbon. As Carl Sagan used to say, uh, I am a carbon chauvinist. Um, and, you know, people have tried to think about silicon and so on and phosphorus and, and, and so on. But I think carbon is the, is the best building block for organic molecules and all that goes beyond it. And then if you're stuck with the atomic physics of carbon, then I know there's graphene and, uh, and, and so on, but you're almost certainly, if you've got things that are moving around, you're almost certainly going to bear, if you're going to have any complex at all, you're going to be dealing with chiral molecules. And it's a jigsaw puzzle. It's got to all fit together. And if it's got to all fit together, you're stuck with one system. You can do your jigsaw puzzle with a picture up or you can do it with a picture down, which masochists like to do. And it's got to all fit together either way. And I think all of these intricate enzymes, and it's really, a, you know, what little I know about this business, I'm totally impressed by um, the way these intricate mechanisms evolved and were able to and function as well as they do. I mean, we're fixated right now, of course, about disease and and all the tragic consequences of, of COVID and many other things. But so, you know, so much of, you know, life on, on earth as we see it, it, it it's astonishing how, how, how well this works. And so you can say it's evolution, it's all perfectly natural that it, it got to this point. But it, it's still very impressive. And I think any, any engineer looking at, you know, how, how DNA replicates or how some medical function happens inside a cell can only just be impressed and amazed. I agree, as a physicist looking at biology. <laughs> <laughs> biologists, may, biologists may have a different view, but that, that, I, I, I'm just sort of stunned when I, every time I try and figure out what, what somebody says, this is what happens. I say, That's amazing. <laughs> I'll give you a little break here. Um, Stuart has offered to say something about the issue of chorality. And Wonderful. Organism. Wonderful. So Help, moments break, Help me it? out, please, Stuart. <laughs> Uh, I, I was only going to say uh, uh, what, what you were saying in, in your last answer, really, which is that uh, metabolic pathways all have to fit together. So it has to be one or the other. Uh, um, but, but it's interesting that natural selection is so powerful uh, that if an organism wants to make the wrong handed version of a particular biochemical, uh, then there's no problem in evolving enzymes to make it. So for example, uh, the, the amino acid arginine, uh, which normally exists made, uh, you know, en entirely in left-handed form, uh, you can find that in nature in the D form because some organisms choose to make it that way and they do so because it's actually poisonous to other organisms so uh, all i'm trying to say really is that the power of natural selection is immense and if you want to make things the wrong way around you really can but of course uh, organisms compete with each other all the time in terms of being able to reproduce uh, fast and so ordinarily the solution is that you do everything in the most economical and cheapest way. And so you build a system that's built out of the amino acids and sugars and stuff that you find uh, lurking in the environment anyway. Thanks. Uh, I, I, th I think I followed that and, and that sounds to me a much better answer than the one I gave. So thanks. Okay. Um, could I ask a, a different question, actually? Uh, uh, it, it's rather an entertaining question, I think. Um, uh, when you were at the Institute of Theoretical Astronomy in, in, in Cambridge, 
uh, actually, uh, Fred Hoyle must have been knocking around uh, this at least sometimes. Was that the case? OK. Um... Uh, I mean, Fred Hoyle claimed that uh, viruses came from space. Um, wh what happened to that story? Oh, OK. Um... There were, again, there were probably three questions there. Fred Hoyle was my boss for five, for three years, I think, when I went to the Institute of Astronomy, and I think I saw him twice. Um, certainly never spoke to him. Uh, he wasn't really very evident at that time, and perhaps unsurprisingly, he stopped being the, the boss, but it was still, he created an amazingly uh, fertile, scientifically fertile place, and that was, that was uh, and that was great. I mean, forever indebted to him. You know, as a child, I used to, I read his books and um, uh, heard him on the radio and so on. And he was complete inspiration. And I, I, I'm a great admirer of the man. And, um, and he, the best science that he did was amongst the best that, um, you know, physicists and astronomers have ever done. Um, and some of it is very embarrassing. And I think the diseases from space, and I have a book, a copy of the book um, uh, that he wrote on this, which I bought in a, a Hay on Y used bookstore for six pence, I think. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of madness. Um, uh, another thing that he said was he thought he'd seen chloroform, chlorophyll, excuse me, not chloroform, chlorophyll in interstellar spectra, because Bob brought up chlorophyll, and he, he wrote papers saying he was seeing chlorophyll, and, and of course any spectroscopist looking at this said was shaking their head in, in bemusement. Um, so some of these forays, um, I think, were, like many of his others, quite quixotic. Um, and, you know, even the phrase, the Big Bang, uh, was his pejorative put-down of an evolutionary cosmology here, evolution again, it was an evolutionary cosmology and it turns out the phrase everyone used and he was a famous proponent of the alternative steady state theory. So, you, you know, it, it's, 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 with, with Fred Hoyle, it's a mix, it's a mixed bag, but I, I think he, you know, by the, the greatest things he did, which were considerable, he, he was one of the, you know, famous scientists and, and, and a great person. Um, he, he, his problem with the theory of evolution, I think the phrase, if I recall correctly, was the, you know, the probability that the, what you have just described as natural selec um, selection, his, uh, was as likely to happen as a pile of junk would assemble into a, uh, an airliner in, in a junkyard. Um, and I, I think he, he even people at the time, let alone now, would, would say, no, I totally disagree with that statement. I mean, natural selection and all the things that go along with it, um, you know, both in both at the sort of level of animals and the level of, of biochemistry, uh, really, you know, there's plenty of things we don't fully understand, but the, the basic principle seems to be just what's going on. It's just fine. And so I think, you know, there's places where he was quite wrong-headed, um, uh, from my, my book, but places where the same imagination took us to took us uh, to places that we, we never would have gone otherwise. Even for carbon, you know, making the carbon requires a miracle in nuclear physics. I went to what it is, but it requires a miracle. He said this miracle happens. And by God, he was right. Um, can I just ask, um, uh, I guess, Andreas, I mean, how are we doing for time? Do I have to be selective about questions? There are about another seven or eight questions, but... Uh... Well, we're heading up to nine o'clock. It's really up to Roger in terms of when he needs to give his uh, his uh, next uh, lecture or seminar. Well, well I, I'm supposed to be meeting with my my class. Um, I've got to, got to teach. I have a day job which is teaching students, and I've got to meet with them five minutes. But yeah. uh, I, I can go on a, go on a bit longer. So I'll try and give shorter answers. So uh, I think, uh, I think uh, the answer, of Robert, of Bob, is that probably one more question will probably have to suffice if uh, okay. Robert, Roger's going to get off for nine o'clock. OK. Um, I, uh, this one is a, a, an attractive one to ask, I think. John Nissen says, consciousness is another example of generated chirality, since we're aware of the difference between left and right. Please comment. Consciousness. OK, I believe I looked at your earlier speakers and Roger Penrose uh, had uh, 
out their ideas about consciousness, relating them to quantum gravity and so on. Um, I would defer to him as I do on all matters. So um, I, 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 um, I am. I don't understand consciousness. I think it's a wonderful. I think it's a wonderful question, and I've read uh, books about it, and uh, particularly like things by Francis Crick and so on, and people thinking about more generalizations of what our version of consciousness might be in some other imagined living entity. But uh, I do not understand it. It has nothing to contribute to what you could read in semi-popular science books. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks very much, Roger. I, I think. Um... I'd like to thank all the people for answering, uh, for asking questions. It's very nice to be left with too many questions rather than too few. Uh, but I think we've worked, Roger, hard enough this evening. So could I hand back to, I guess, Andreas or Tony? Well, I'd like to thank Roger very much for giving up his time to talk to us. And I think that it's, it's wonderful to take a tour through all these different phenomena of physics, chemistry, and biology, and find this thread of chirality, sort of linking, linking it all, and, and needing really a lot more thought and a lot more experiment. So this is a very exciting topic, and thank you very much, Roger. And thank you very much for your invitation, and especially for all the wonderful questions. I really did enjoy them, and they've already got me thinking again. So. Um, so I do appreciate that. And let's all hope that in reality, we can all meet in the, you know, people can meet in the same place before too long. Yeah, yeah.